Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium where we are now going to talk about data science interview questions. So in this video, we're gonna look at a blog by Simply Learn where they have the top 50 data science interview questions and answers for 2021. Now, the reason I'm kind of making this video and I probably also wanna make this a series is because there are so many blog posts out there that have very textbook questions and they give very textbook answers. But in reality, when you're actually answering these questions during an actual interview, you might wanna spice things up and add a little bit more shades of practicality to it. And so this video is going to be me reading through these questions, looking at their answers, and also trying to give my own two cents on, well, how I would improve some of these answers. And so I hope that you will enjoy this video. It's a nice little trial for me to do. So let's get to it. But of course, before we get to it, I would really appreciate it if you could give this video a good old like. The more you like, the more other people will see the video and then they'll like it and the phenomenon goes on and I'll become a really happy person and you'll be a happy person and it helps everyone. Also, please do check out our Discord server down in the description below. We are going to be talking about a bunch of things over there, so hop on over. I'm pretty active over there. Let's start a community together. And with that, let's get started with the video. Question number one. What are the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning? So I like this little table here. They say supervised learning works on labeled data as input. Unsupervised learning works on unlabeled data as input. Fair. Supervised learning has a feedback mechanism. I do not know what a feedback mechanism is in this context, but if you do, please comment in the description. And if you're in an interview, do try to at least describe one line of what that actually is, because I'm sure your interviewer will also be pretty curious. Uh, let's see, so supervised learning, you had decision trees, logistic regression, support vector machines, that's cool. Whereas unsupervised learning is k-means, hierarchical clustering, and a priori algorithm. So pretty cool, I love that they gave example models here. But in addition to this, I would also like to know an additional real world application of where you would use supervised learning and where you would use unsupervised learning. For example, it could be something as simple as just saying fraud classification for supervised learning, and then probably topic modeling for unsupervised learning. And you probably get into very small details for both if your interviewer requires it. Try to gauge the room, try to see if your interviewer is interested, and only then you give that more information. How is logistic regression done? So logistic regression measures the relationship between the dependent variable and one or more independent variables by estimating probability using its underlying logistic function. And they have a couple of images here. This is a pretty broad question, and I would first ask the interviewer what they really want to hear specifically. Because if you start going on a rant about the likelihood estimation of logistic regression, then they might just tune out and they'll be like, oh, that's, that's not what I wanted to hear. So you wanna first clarify what they want to hear before actually giving your entire response and going super deep into it. It's communication that's important here. Explain the steps in making a decision tree. Take the entire data as input, calculate the entropy of a target variable as well as other predictor attributes, calculate your information gain of all attributes, choose the attributes with the highest information gain as the root node, and repeat the same procedure on every branch until the decision node of each branch is finalized. And they give a little example there. So I kind of like this response because it's pretty simple, it's to the point, doesn't go into very, very deep details. And again, if there are more details, your interviewer will ask you to specify more details, probably along like, what is information gain? Or what is entropy here? And can you explain it in simpler words? But all in all, good explanation. How do you build a random forest model? A random forest model is built up of a number of decision trees. If you split the data into different packages and make a decision tree in each of the different groups of data, the random forest brings all of these trees together. So first of all, this definition seems a little bit more vague. I would probably go a little more technical than what is given right here, but still a pretty good description for a one or two liner sentence too. Maybe talk a little bit about ensemble learning algorithms and how random forest combats overfitting, but all in all, 
pretty good answer. How can you avoid overfitting of your model? Overfitting refers to a model that is only set for a very small amount of data and ignores the bigger picture. There are three main methods to overfitting. Keep the model simple, use cross-validation techniques, and use regularization techniques. So overall, they do have the right key points here. However, I want to completely emphasize this first point. Keeping the model simple is probably the most important feature of this entire three-step process here. Because with keeping your model simple and only using certain features, you are eliminating so much of the hassle of interpretation of your model. And model interpretability is extremely important in the industry. Although, sometimes it might be a little overlooked in academia. So keeping your model simple, very important, and probably emphasize that more than the others. What are the feature selection methods used to select the right variables? There are two main methods for feature selection, filter and wrapper methods, okay? This involves linear discriminant analysis, ANOVA, chi-squared, and the wrapper methods involve the forward selection, backward selection, and recursive feature elimination. So all in all, this is an example of a very textbook answer. However, when I talk about feature selection, especially in an interview, I would more talk about like the data analysis standpoint of trying to determine the correlations that exist between your potential features and also your labels, if there are any. And then using certain techniques there to just determine which features to select and which to not. In addition to that, there is also like the semantic side of things of like, okay, the meaning of the features actually matter. If there are two features that have very similar meaning to each other, you would only want to select one and that too, the one that makes more sense even semantically. So these are just some extra points that you want to keep in mind when answering these interview questions in a more practical sense. You are given a data set consisting of variables with more than 30% of missing values. How do you deal with them? The following are ways to handle missing data values. If the data set is large, we can just simply remove the rows with missing data values. Okay, so you should not really be resorting to removing rows because removing rows means removing data, which could be potentially used by your model. So instead of that, I would probably say you would need to take that column that has the 30% missing values, try to see if you can impute certain values in those columns. A good library for this is scikit-learn's simple imputer. Now, once you've imputed certain values to this, try to determine the correlation between this column and also the label column. And just try to see if there is some correlation at all. If there exists a correlation, then that means that even though that this column is missing so many values, it is still useful for predicting the output of your model. If there is no correlation on the other hand, well, you can probably think of just removing the column itself and not the rows of data. What is dimensionality reduction and what are its benefits? Dimensionality reduction refers to the process of converting a data set with vast dimensions into data with fewer dimensions to convey similar information concisely. This reduction helps in compressing data and reducing storage space. It also reduces computation time as fewer dimensions lead to less computing. It removes redundant features. For example, there's no point storing a value in two different units. So I think that this is also a little bit too simplistic for dimensionality reduction, but it gets the broad strokes right. In general though, like in a practical sense of using dimensionality reduction, there is actually also quite a bit of cons, specifically in terms of data interpretability. When you create these algebraic combinations of features, and use those features as actual features to your model, you lose a sense of interpretation, which is very important in production systems. And so there might be situations where you'll see that the cons actually outweigh the pros, despite the pros being, well, you can compute faster and you can train faster, even with a large amount of data. It's important to just note that and keep it in mind, at least for your interviewer to know that you are aware of some of the shortcomings that dimensionality reduction has to offer. How will you create eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the following three cross three matrix? So this is a very technical problem and well, they just solve it very technically as well. But I would also recommend you to understand what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. 3Blue1Brown has a great video resource on this. So I just recommend you to check that out too. How should you maintain a deployed model? 
The steps to maintain a deployed model are, first is monitor. So constant monitoring of all models is needed to determine their performance accuracy. And when you change something, you want to figure out how your changes are going to affect things. This needs to be monitored to ensure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. That's absolutely right. You do need to monitor every single time you do deploy a model. You want to make sure that how many requests are there coming in a second? How many 500s are we seeing because of an internal error that's there? If we do see 500s, do we have logs that we can use to debug that? Especially as soon as you deploy new code, these graphs are something that you really need to check. Evaluate, then evaluate metrics of the current model that are calculated to determine if a new algorithm is needed. The new models are compared to each other to determine which model performs the best. The best performing model is rebuilt on the current state of data. I would say that these last three points on evaluate, compare, and rebuild, these are not in the deployment phase, but they should actually happen much before, like in the model selection slash training phase. And yeah, you don't really need to mention it here. What are recommender systems? Okay, so here, again, a super broad question where they talk about collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. So these are fine, but the main problem here is that we don't use collaborative filtering and content-based filtering on their own because of issues of scalability. It's just way too, too many real-time systems, it's way too much data to just use these techniques on their own. Instead, a lot of recommendation systems try to create vectors for every user basically called embedding vectors, which encode the meaning for every user, or like product vectors, which encode the meaning for every single product. And technically these vectors can be plotted in, in a, some like n-dimensional space. And then we can find like for a given user or for a given product, we can find the nearest users or the nearest products to give recommendations. Spotify, for example, actually uses this where they take a user vector and try to find the nearest user vectors or the song vectors and try to find the nearest song vectors with something called approximate nearest neighbors, which is a super fast implementation of the nearest neighbors algorithm. Here's a GitHub repository showing that code. I do encourage you to actually look at this. I'll link it down in the description below. All in all, just try to make sure that you're aware that content-based filtering, collaborative filtering, and their base form is not very usable in a production environment. What is the significance of a p-value? So a p-value, typically less than 0.05, indicates strong evidence against the null hypothesis, so you reject it. P-value greater than 0.05 is weak evidence against the null hypothesis, so you accept the null hypothesis, not quite. P-value at 0.05, this is considered to be marginal, meaning it can go either way. This is an example of an answer that is not really technically correct either. In fact, in the simplest terms, p-value, it represents a probability, a probability of how ridiculous the null hypothesis is or seems. In fact, Cassie Kozarkov, who is a chief AI data scientist at Google, has an amazing explanation of what a p-value is, and so I highly recommend you watch her video. Also adding to this, the 0.05 is kind of an arbitrarily hard cutoff. Like, you don't just not reject or not make a change just because it's 0.051, for example. There may be certain situations where there's just no reason to keep a current system, and as long as the new system significantly doesn't, like, drastically harm, we would use that system despite what the p-value might say, even if it is like not completely a 0.05. How can outliers be treated? You can drop outliers only if it is a garbage value, and they give an example. And if the outliers have extreme values, they can be removed. For example, if all data points are clustered between 0 to 10, but one point lies at 100, then we can remove this point. If you cannot drop outliers, you can try the following. Try a different model, try normalizing the data, and you can try using algorithms that are less affected by outliers. For this answer, I would actually err towards not dropping outliers on its own. If there are certain outliers in the data, I would pick them out and individually see what makes those outliers outliers. Like why do they exist and how did they get their values? If we see that some outliers just happen because of actual human errors, then maybe we can toss it. But if they organically did appear and did happen, you're better off including that in your data so that your model can kind of also pick up on them. Again, it really depends on the data and the problem. Can you calculate accuracy using a confusion matrix? 
I like how they gave that figure over here. And yes, you can calculate simple accuracy, true positive plus true negative divided by all four, which is exactly what they do. And with a confusion ma matrix, you can also calculate like precision and recall pretty easily. And that's exactly what they do in the next question. So that's cool. People who bought this also bought blank. Recommendations seen on Amazon are a result of which algorithm? Textbook definition says collaborative filtering, but like I said, recommendation algorithms can be implemented very differently these days in order to compensate for scalability. Write a basic SQL query that lists all orders with customer information. So the way that I would actually give a SQL question is instead of just like one question after another that is not related to each other, I would give a scenario. From that, start with simple questions maybe like a very simple question of just like getting orders and then building on top of that to make more and more complex queries. This is, can be done to just get a good sense of how well a candidate can break down a problem, convert it into code, and also get an idea of their technical skills of how much SQL they really know. You are given a data set on cancer detection. You have built a classification model and achieved an accuracy of 96%. Why shouldn't you be happy with this model performance and what can you do about it? Cancer detection results in imbalanced data. An imbalanced data set accuracy should not be based as a measure of performance. It is important to focus on the remaining 4%, which presents patients who are wrongly diagnosed. Yeah, this is pretty true. But adding to this is even if we had a model that says deaf model response return false or something like that, and we just gave the same value for everything, we can get an accuracy of like 96% because that is the majority case and that happens because of class imbalances. So maybe you can provide a very small example there instead of just a basic textbook definition and also probably add some evaluation metrics that would be useful, maybe a precision, a recall or something else that you think would be completely useful depending on the problem at hand. Which of the following machine learning algorithms can be used for inputting missing values for both categorical and continuous variables? Okay. So for actually imputing values, I wouldn't use a specific machine learning algorithm because machine learning models are very noisy. I would rather just impute these values with whatever the mean of that column is or median or anything that just makes sense. Maybe for a categorical variable, you would want to impute it with just another class label of unknown. In any case, I would probably use scikit-learn's simple imputer, like I mentioned before, for this case, rather than actually putting the burden of imputation on another model, which could be another source of error that you would need to deal with. Below are eight actual values of the target variable in the train file. What is the entropy of the target variable? Pretty simple calculation of entropy, but in this case, I would also want to make sure that you understand what entropy is, what information gain is, and how they relate to each other, just from a broad picture standpoint. Because in many cases, they probably won't just give you a typical exam question like this. We want to predict the probability of death from heart disease based on three risk factors, age, gender, and blood cholesterol level. What is the most appropriate algorithm for this case? So the answer seems to be logistic regression. If we wanted to predict a probability of death, probably something like logistic regression, which actually results in a probability value, quote unquote, would be useful. It's also important to note that logistic regression doesn't necessarily produce probability values, especially if the data set is imbalanced. I have an entire video on model calibration to, to actually attest to this. After studying the behavior of a population, you have identified four special individual types that are valuable to your study. You would like to find all the users who are most similar to each individual type. Which algorithm is the most appropriate for the study? They say the answer here is k-means clustering, but it might be even better to model this as a supervised learning problem. What if, since we know that there's four types of users, we can create a four-way classification and we can now set a very, very high probability threshold. Let's say it could be like 0.8 or 0.9 for a given class. And only if it is above this threshold, then we would classify or categorize the variables as that particular class. There are some other ways that you could probably do this too. Maybe you can create four different classifiers, each of which are binary classifiers for individual classes and also have like a very high threshold. But in general, 
K-means clustering is not the only way to look at a problem. We can formulate a problem in multiple ways. Your organization has a website where visitors randomly receive one of two coupons. It is also possible that visitors to their website will not receive a coupon. You have been asked to determine if offering a coupon to website visitors has an impact on purchase decisions. Which analysis method should you use? So they say one way ANOVA, but that is a very, very broad answer to give. And there is so many concepts here that you would need to illustrate of A-B testing. So whether you're using like hypothesis testing or Bayesian testing, you first wanna define your problem. You wanna make it clear what your KPIs are. In this case, it's like purchase conversion. And you also want to also just say what other considerations that you would make before conducting the test. It could be on sample size, it could be test duration or anything else. And during this entire process, do ask questions to your interviewer. Just go back and forth. Any little detail that you think that is not very clear, you ask your interviewer because it's super important for them to know and they will also think, that you are asking the right questions, as you should be. And well, that's all I'm gonna look at for this episode. Everything else here is just on basic concepts. So I'm gonna leave this video over here. I hope you all liked this kind of video, and I'm planning on making this a recurring series. Comment down below if you really like it. If you like the video, please do give this a good old thumbs up. Please subscribe for more content and join our Discord server for more amazing chats with yours truly and so many others like you. And we're trying to grow a community here, so I appreciate your support. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.